Okay, now we're good. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege we have of meeting together again as a, a church family. Lord, we realize there's a lot of that are not here today, and yet, Lord, we're thankful for just being able to meet together. We, um, we just praise you for the fact that you are involved in our lives, that you, you're there for, for every concern that we have. Father, that you are, you're aware of that concern and you are ready to meet that need. We may not fully recognize the way that you meet it, but Lord, we, you, you are there for us. Lord, I, I again this morning want to pray for our COVID situation in this country. We pray that you would, would give each of us wisdom on how to navigate the, these times. Lord, I just pray also for, for our nation, a lot of uncertainty there, and yet we just pray that you would help us to be an example of, uh, of people of faith, not people of fear. Lord, we pray for our nation's leaders. We just ask that you would draw their hearts and minds to yourself. We pray for our, our military people and our law enforcement people. We ask that you would protect them as they protect us. We pray for the individual, uh, those indiv individuals who are in the law enforcement or, or our military that have a connection with this church. We pray that you would, would give them wisdom and, and give them strength and, and boldness in their witness. Lord, this morning as we look into your word, we ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding and help us really grasp what you'd have to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are, uh, we are in the life of Christ, and actually quite a ways into it. We're going to be reading from Matthew 15 this morning. I'm going to read Matthew 15, 1 through 6. It says, And the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother, and thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Well, as we, uh, as we continue in our study of the life of Christ, I again want to remind you that understanding who Jesus is is essential to our faith. Now, I've said many times that you can always recognize a cult because a cult will never give Jesus his proper place. This thing is not going the direction it should go this morning. Took me a minute to realize that. Okay. So there are many who will say Jesus was a good man or a great teacher, or they may say that he is a famous prophet or a wise counselor. But if they do not see him as God in the flesh, with no beginning and no ending, they do not understand the Jesus of the Bible. Now, you've heard me say many times that anyone who does not teach that Jesus existed from eternity past with the Father is teaching heresy. So in studying the life of Christ, we're seeing, seeing God in action in a physical body. Now, and we've gone over this, this a lot. It says, as we follow Jesus' earthly ministry, there are several significant things that we'll continue to notice. We will continue to see that in the life of Christ, everything that Jesus does is intentional. He's on a mission. He's guided by a plan. We've, we've gone over that several times. And the, the second thing we notice is that we constantly see the contrast between the goodness of God and the sinfulness of man. And the third thing we notice is is that all through the Gospels, Jesus is constantly challenging the Jewish culture. Now, every area of the Jewish worldview that is inconsistent with the character of God 
Jesus calls into question. Now, I've said uh, this week after week, and we have, are going to see this play out again in this morning's message. And finally, the narrative that we have in Scripture gives us a clear picture of how Jesus interacted with the people of that day. And since God is unchangeable, we can be sure that in the same way he interacted with them, he will interact with you and I. Now, last week, we looked at the prayer life of Christ, and we saw that that prayer was the environment where Jesus lived. It was a very, the very air he breathed. And in saying that, it's important to also note that Jesus lived a life of constant interruptions. He was a person in demand. His disciples were constantly calling on him, uh, as were the sick and, and the needy, and even the Pharisees and scribes made demands on him, and Jesus took time for them all. Even when uh, the children came to him and the disciples tried to send them away, Jesus said, forbid them not. Yet in spite of the busyness of his personal life, Jesus was in continual prayer. He literally prayed without ceasing. And as, as God in the flesh, he modeled total dependence on the Father. We, on the other hand, are weak and needy. And even though the privilege of prayer has been made available to us, we often view it as an inconvenience or an unnecessary part of daily existence. Now, the purpose of our studying the life of Christ is first to get a better picture of the character of God, and second, to learn how to walk more effectively with him as believers. And after seeing the example of Jesus' prayer life, hopefully we too will see the necessity of prayer in our lives. And I, I'm not talking about showing up for our Wednesday prayer time or things like that. I'm talking about daily. Daily being aware that, uh, that we can bring our, our needs before the Father. I mentioned last week that we as a church need to make the same request that the of the Lord that the disciples made when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. In James uh, 5.16, it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, that's where we, we kind of ended last week. This morning, we're going to, to take another look at the religious leaders of Jesus' day. We, we know, I, I know we've looked at them often, uh, we can't help but see the conflict between Jesus and these, these leaders all through the Gospels. The Holy Spirit did not inspire the authors of the Gospels to write so much detail about this conflict, this conflict for, no, for no reason. This has been uh, recorded so that we could learn some valuable lessons. And we have now moved into the final months of the final year of Jesus' life in his physical body. Now Matthew sets the stage for us in Matthew 15, 1 and 2. And then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now the Pharisees, as we have seen from previous study, were some of the most legalistic people who've ever lived. And the legalist spends an inordinate amount of time watching the actions of others and judging what they do. Here it appears that uh, the disciples started eating before they washed. Now it may be that they did wash, but that they did not wash in a way that was consistent with Jewish tradition. I say that because Mark records this same instance in Mark 7, 2, and 3, and says, Now when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with the file, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. So before the scribes and Pharisees would sit down to a meal, they went through an elaborate ceremony of cleansing. 
Now, what the disciples did was ignore these man-made regulations for washing. So, it's probable that the disciples did wash, but they ignored the ritual that had been, so, that had been established by the religious hierarchy. And then the scribes and Pharisees, seeking to find fault with Jesus and with his disciples, confronted them publicly. Uh, looking again at Matthew 15, 1 and 2, it says, And the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Jesus, taking this as a teaching opportunity, then answered their question with another question. In Matthew 15, 3 through 6, and he answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother, and thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Now the interesting thing here is that the Pharisees put the tradition of the elders above the authority of the word of God. Jesus, of course, knowing the hearts of all men, confronted them on this point. In Israel, when parents got too old to care for themselves, their children were responsible for their physical welfare. Here we see the scribes and Pharisees made it possible for people to ignore the physical needs of their parents. They did this by proclaiming that the portion of their income that was to go towards supporting their mom and dad was dedicated to God. This was called korban, which means a sacrificial gift. Now Jesus, as he so, has so many times confronted the worldview of these religious leaders. Now in this particular case, he confronted the core belief that their traditions were of higher authority than the scriptures. And notice the passion of Jesus as he confronts these religious leaders. They, they were guilty of teaching um, guilty of teaching the doctrines of men as the truth of God. And in Matthew 15, 7 through 9, he says, Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. These religious leaders made a pretense of worshiping. They were supposed to be pointing the people to God and supplying spiritual leadership. And Jesus is actually quoting, uh, in quoting uh, Isaiah 29, 13, which we looked at uh, a while back, labeled them as false shepherds. The accusation he made against them is this, they were teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now this is why it's so important for you and I to know what the scriptures say. Because things are no different today. There are all kinds of teachers in this world that are teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Now this didn't just happen with the Pharisees. This has been a danger all down through the, church, through, through the ages. Teachers expounding an ethical code that sounds good, but moves people away from the truth. Now, we find this in many churches today. Churches that have lead, uh, leaders who lead people astray by ignoring Scripture, especially Paul's teaching to the church. Often these men do not understand the function of the Old Testament law. <clears throat> Therefore, they attempt to place believers under restrictions that were never intended for the church. Satan has used these false teachers to confuse people and keep them from seeing the liberty that they have in Christ. Now this battle for truth has not changed since the church began. And uh, that's why Paul wrote this in, in Colossians 20, 
or 2, 20 through 23. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principle of the world, why as though living in the world, you subject yourself to regulations, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandment and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Notice that these things only have an appearance of wisdom, but they are, have no value against the fleshly heart of man. In other words, they will not help you defeat sin areas in your life. God goes one, or Paul goes one step further in addressing the problem in, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, he says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Notice that he refers to these men as departing from the faith, and teaching the doctrine of demons. Now part of the doctrine was forbidding to marry, and another part was abstaining from certain foods. Isn't it wonderful to know that God has always had something greater in mind for the believer than a list of do's and don'ts? And yet many today try to put themselves under the dietary rules of the Old Testament because they think this makes them closer to God. This actually takes them farther away from the truth. In Matthew 15, 10 and 11, it says, When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Notice that Jesus purposely addressed the crowd who had witnessed the accusations of the scribes and Pharisees about eating with unwashed hands. He wanted the crowd to understand the truth of God. It is man's heart that defiles him, not what he eats or drinks or wears or the style of music that he listens to. Those things may be a reflection of his heart, but they are not the things that defile him. Man, a man cannot make himself acceptable to God by changing his outward appearance and changing his diet. In Matthew 15, 12, it says, Then the disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Well, of course the Pharisees were offended at what Jesus said. It was the forced compliance to man-made doctrines that gave these men their clout. The disciples were concerned about the constant, <clears throat> the constant confrontation between Jesus and these religious leaders. They understood the dangerous ground Jesus was walking on in confronting them. They knew the animosity of these so-called holy men. These religious leaders did not have a genuine walk with God, and often the legalistic do not. All they had was a list of rules and religious ordinances they were following. Now look again at, uh, at 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Our sufficiency is of God. We don't live the Christian life by keeping a list of do's and don'ts. We live the Christian life through a relationship with our Heavenly Father. The letter of the law only leads to legalism and hypocrisy. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now that was the, the problem with the Pharisees. Their legalism only led to self-righteousness. 
The self-righteousness of man can never make him justified before God. It actually condemns him. If uh, we go on to Matthew 15, 13, and 14, Jesus responded then. Now, he's responding here to the fears of the disciples. And he says, but, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. <clears throat> they are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. You know, the analogy here of a plant that Jesus uses is interesting because the beliefs of religious leaders were, in a way, rooted to the Old Testament writings, but it was because they had added to them. The problem was that the most important element was missing, and that element was God. Remember, I mentioned before that there was a fundamental flaw in the Pharisees' approach to Scripture. To them, it was all academic. It was the letter of the law that mattered. It's sad that they missed the purpose behind God giving the written word. God gave us the Bible so that we can enjoy the type of relationship with our Creator that enables us to reflect His character. The Pharisees, however, never moved beyond the written word to a relationship. The written scriptures became their focus instead of God being their focus. Now, I'm not putting down the written word. Um, the truth of God is here. It's here, but we don't worship the book. The book points to Christ and points to God. We don't worship the book. In Matthew 15, 15 through 20, it says, And Peter answered and said to him, Explain the parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth, which come from the heart, and they defile a man. <clears throat> For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Now as we continue, we see that the disciples were also confused. When reading through this, we need to remind ourselves that the disciples were Jewish. Matthew brings this out because he was writing to the Jewish believers. Jesus was confronting the Jewish culture. A person's culture impacts everything he sees and hears and thinks. Now as we go through Scripture, Scripture will challenge our culture also. There's no culture is always man-made. There's no culture that isn't man-made. And so as we read the scripture, it will always challenge our culture. But it's not surprising because of that that Peter asked for further explanation. For his whole life, Peter has been taught about things that physically defile the person. And now Jesus is teaching them something different. He was not only challenging the scribes and Pharisees' worldview, but he's, he's also demanding that the disciples look at their own belief system. There were many Old Testament instructions about defilement. And most of them, if you look back at them, have to do with health issues. Instructions God gave to prevent the spread of disease. The Jews had a mistaken had mistaken physical contamination for spiritual defilement. What Jesus said sounded very un-Jewish, but he was bringing the truth of the Old Testament back into a right perspective. God was not interested in the way people washed their hands. He wanted men to have a right relationship with himself. Now think about it. Do you think God is really concerned about the way you wash your hands or comb your hair? I mean, some of you guys would have a tough time with the care home, home the, the, the combing of the hair. You know, 
Roy and Stan and, you know, a few of you around would have a tough time with that. But um, God's not interested. It's just not important. Jesus had a way of giving the disciples something to think about and then at a later date bringing the subject up again. And we see him do this in Matthew 16 where he again spoke to the, the disciples further about the teaching of the Jewish religious leaders. And so we're going to jump ahead uh, a few verses now and jump into Matthew 16, 5 through 11. It says, Now when the disciples had come to the other side, they'd forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisee, of the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Oh, you have little faith. Why do you reason among yourselves? Because you have brought no bread. Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 5,000 uh, or 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Now this, <clears throat> this is an interesting section of scripture because we again see that the disciples, like all men, focus on their physical needs. And like all men, uh, this at times causes them to miss the greater picture. When Jesus um, made this statement, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he was using a word picture that should have been understood by his disciples. Leaven is, is yeast, of course. Uh, I'm sure you knew that. Uh, in scripture the, and Jewish history, yeast has always been a picture of sin. During the Passover, the Jews were to remove all leaven from their homes. And this would then, uh, they would then go seven Seven days eating only unleavened bread. This was a physical portrayal of uh, the nation of Israel de dealing with sin areas in their lives and setting themselves apart for the purposes of God. Now Paul used a similar picture in uh, the New Testament when speaking to the Corinthians. In uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. It says, uh, do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The point is this. Because of, of their, their Jewish background, the disciples should have understood right off that Jesus was not talking about physical bread. But they didn't pick up on that, on what Jesus was telling them, until he reminded them of the miracle of the loaves and the fish when he fed the multitudes. And in uh, Matthew sixteen twelve, it says, And then they understood that he did not, tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So Jesus again brings them back to a warning about doctrine. But what is doctrine? Now many people nowadays think that doctrine is bad, that it just causes division among believers. But is that true? If it is, why did Jesus spend so much time talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees? And we find the word doctrine used 50 times in our Bibles. And it means the content of the teaching. That's all it means. It's just the content of the teaching. When Jesus is talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he speaks of the content or core of their teaching. Doctrine refers to core values. 
as a church, we have a doctrinal statement. And that statement reflects our belief that the Bible is the supreme authority. So I'm, I'm, there's no way any, I'm not in any way trying to take away from the Word of God. This is the supreme authority. We worship God. He has given us his word. He's given us his word so we will understand how he thinks and, and we'll understand his plan of salvation for man. This is the supreme authority. Jesus told the disciples to beware of the core values of the Sadducees and Pharisees and referring to their their doctrines or core beliefs as leaven. They had, they had perverted the word of God. And like I said, leaven is yeast, and a very small amount of yeast soon affects a large amount of dough, causing, causing it to rise. A little yeast affects enough dough for making several loaves of bread when the, the bread is baked. The yeast is nearly tasteless. And because of, of this principle... Leaven is used as a type or a picture of sin in the Bible. False teaching or false doctrine may seem harmless and insignificant at first, but later it has a great impact. Like yeast, false doctrine is often very hard to detect, working gradually until it finally affects every area of a person's worldview. So just as Jesus warned the disciples of the doctrines of the Pharisees, we too need to be aware of the dangers of the doctrines of men. The doctrines of religious, the, the religious rulers in Israel made it possible for the truth of the word of God to, um, made it impossible for the truth of the word of God to really fit the Jewish worldview. It, it made it it made it almost impossible. It just wasn't the same. God, as they understood him, was there only for Israel. And not even all of Israel could have access to God. That's why one of the first things Jesus did was travel through Samaria. You remember when we, we studied that. He traveled through Samaria, and in the middle of Samaria, he tells his disciples, lift up your eyes, for the fields are white unto har harvest. And the Jews never went through Samaria. The Pharisees thought that only those who were... Not, well, um, it just wasn't the, the non-Jews that were unacceptable. The Pharisees thought that only those who were willing to submit themselves to their particular brand of legalism could be justified before God. And remember what Jesus said to these people in reference to their doctrine. If you go to Matthew 15, 7 through 9, hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The Jews were supposed to be a missionary nation. Instead, they tried to keep the truth that God intended for all mankind to themselves. Now, this effort caused them to eventually lose the reality of a loving God and substituting it for empty religion. Now, in many ways, the doctrines of the Sadducees and Pharisees are similar to many of the false teachings of men today. For doctrine to be true, it has to have its foundation in the Word of God. It is, you're safer just to stick with the Word of God. Let me give you an example of the subtleness of false doctrine. I'm sure you've heard this. People ref referring to this or that person's interpretation of certain scriptures. Somehow, people have come to believe that Scripture can have many different interpretations. That is a false belief. And although it sounds innocent, this belief leads to error. 
what's that false belief is leaven, which can cause people to have a wrong view of the Word of God. There's only one right interpretation, and that is the meaning that the author intended us to understand. Okay, so we want, if we're going to say this, then we want the authority to be in the Word of God. The authority has to be here. Okay, so what does the Word of God say about that? We'll find it's very clear. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So interpretation was never a private matter. If we fix our own interpretation on Scripture, we're no different than the Pharisees or the Sadducees, but we'll be teaching the doctrines of men. The authority of Scripture comes from knowing what God, the Holy Spirit, intended to communicate with man. And he inspired human authors to write the Bible. And not only did the Holy Spirit inspire the authors of Scripture, but he also guides us when we read it. Okay, now, there again, now I'm making a statement. What does this mean? What, where is this found in the Word of God? Okay, let's look at John 16, 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. This is for the believer. We, we need to not spend very much time figuring out, listening to this person's interpretation or that person's interpretation, but really studying the Word to find out it precisely what the Word of God says without me putting any spin on it or anybody else putting any spin on it. Keeping everything in context not removing anything from, from, from the context, but keeping things in context and paying close attention to what it actually says. So the Holy Spirit inspired the authors and guides us as we read Scripture. And this is why we know that 1 Corinthians 2.14 is true. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. No matter how much an unsaved man reads the Bible, he cannot and will not understand it. He will always jump to the wrong conclusion. This is truth. He's not going to get it. This is not my interpretation. This is what the Bible teaches. It's very important to let the Bible speak for itself and not try to reinterpret it. The point is, false doctrine can be very subtle. So we need to know the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. We, and I, I hate to pick on topical teaching, but it's very difficult to teach topically. And poor, poor Don, I put him on this spot every time I ask him to take over for me because I teach chronologically and I teach, you know, uh, a section of scripture. And then I, Don, he doesn't have that privilege, so he ends up choosing a topic. But topical teaching is very difficult because if you're going to be effective at topical teaching, you've got to make sure every proof Every text you use is in context. Every scripture you use is in context. Because you can make the Bible say anything. And this is why the safest way to teach is to teach chronologically. And to teach book by book. And teach the whole book. Now here we're, we're teaching the life of Christ. And it's a little bit more difficult. But I'm still teaching chronologically. We've been taking the, the years of Jesus' ministry. 
But it's very, very important to understand how God gives us his word and, and he's, we can trust it. And you, the more you study it chronologically, the more you realize how solid it is. There's, he wanted us to know the truth. He wanted us to know about him. He wanted us to understand uh, how we walk with him. It's not a big mystery. I remember when I was a, younger, a young man looking for the will of God for my life. It's right here. He doesn't want us to keep any, any secrets from us. He wants us to understand who he is and how he has provided salvation for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and then how we can walk with him. That's his focus. That's what he wants. But we do that by studying the Bible in chronologically in a systematic or when you when, if you're Janet and I were we dated for three years uh, it took her a long time to get around to deciding that I was going to be worth it you know um, but often either I would be away at school or she'd be away at school and you know there's not once that she sent a letter and I started in the middle uh, that could really be risky you could maybe not understand what she was saying. No, you started at the beginning. God has sent us his word, and, uh, and we, need to, we need to read his word in the same way. You start at the beginning. Okay, well, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> but we need to know the word of God. Scripture is to be taken very seriously. So we don't want to look for at mystical interpretations. The Bible is practical and logical, and we need to take it at face value. And as you read the Old Testament, you come to realize the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was the logical conclusion to everything he had written in the Old Testament. And then the epistles of Paul are the logical conclusion to the birth of the church and how it is to play out. It's not that difficult. He intended for us to understand this. Okay, well, I, I better, better calm down. So thank you very much for putting up with me this morning and, and listening. <laughs>